Hey everyone, um, thanks for joining us for the last town hall of uh, 2023. Really pleased to be here with all of you, as well as with uh, several great colleagues from HCA, John Randall, Ellen Todres, Maz Hanifa, Gary Bader, and I believe uh, Chloe Villani will be joining us very soon. So really pleased to see all of you here, really grateful for the opportunity to give a little bit of an update on what happened in HCA 2023 was quite a remarkable year. So John, if you could move to the next slide, please. So let me take you very quickly through our agenda. I'm gonna begin with an update on some research HCA activities, as well as our progress towards the Atlas assembly. John will then give you a tour of the new HCA data portal that we're very excited about. And then we're gonna have a panel discussion that John will moderate with three members of the organizing committee, Gary, Maz, and Chloe. So we welcome questions throughout. There's um, in the Zoom, there's a Q&A function. Just use the function and we will be monitoring um, the questions there. So if we can move to the next slide, we're gonna start with the recent highlights um, on the next slide. So I'm gonna start with the meetings. We had a, actually a really busy uh, second half of the year in terms of several fantastic HCA meetings. Uh, our last uh, general meeting was um, in July in Toronto. And thank you, Gary, very much for hosting us there. And since then, in October, the HCA Executive Office, together with the HCA Latin America Network, organized a computational and experimental design workshop in Santiago in Chile with 40 participants from seven, uh, seven countries in South America. This workshop was funded by CZI and it follows a similar we it follows a similar training session that we had in Ghana earlier in this in this year um, that we organized in conjunction with the ACA Africa Network and that we talked about when we had our um, general meeting. These these events are really material at uh, training people across the world and, 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 and helping people from all over the world participate in HCA. Um, and so we call these capacity building workshop and they're helping us build an equitable and diverse atlas, both in the data that we collect and in the scientists that do it. And we hope to continue and even expand these opportunities in the year ahead. We really thank all the participants and the organizers. Um, then we were really excited to launch our new HCA Middle East Network. And the big kickoff was our virtual symposium that brought together 159 people from 46 countries. The Middle East Network is already thinking about convening an in-person conference in the coming year. Um, and again, uh, this is an area of the world where we had less representation when HCA was just starting. And it's really exciting to see how much it's taken off. And then most recently, last month, we had the seventh annual HCA Asia meeting, a longstanding tradition, this time for the first time in India, in Kolkata. And if we turn to the next slide, you can see a great photo from the meeting of all the participants. Over 200 people attended in person, a similar number attended online. I had the privilege of joining online. And we're really grateful to the Liver Foundation of West Bengal for hosting um, the meeting and for Partha really for leading the charge on organizing it. Now, these meetings are really a reflection. If we move to the next slide, these meetings are really a reflection. Um, there's a little bit of an animation here. Maybe we can click for it. Um, a really a reflection of um, the effort that we've had in the regional uh, networks in driving our goal of growth in the recent years that you can see in, um, in this animation. I hope it will start uh, running soon. Um, the HCA, when it started, had a far lesser representation in certain parts of the world, but it has changed dramatically in the last seven years, several years. Now, this year, we counted our 3,000, thousands. Oh, my God, that's too hard for me to say. We have more than 3,000 members now. Actually, we have more than 3,200 members now. And this number keeps climbing, as does the number of institutions and countries. Um, we're actually in 99 countries now. Okay, um, this all this activity really leads to great science. And this great science manifests in different ways. And that's really what we're going to see both in the part that I will present and later on from uh, John. So for example, many of these members contributed to the package of HCA publications that is making its way through uh, Nature Publishing Group. It's a very large bundle. It has 60 
five submissions that are already submitted and are under review. Some of them are already in revisions and I believe maybe one paper was even accepted by now. So very, very exciting uh, progress. And this is across the entire nature family of journal and spans different types of scientific categories. So if we can actually click for the animation, we have analytical uh, method papers, we have uh, developmental biology uh, papers, and we have papers focused on ATLAS integration, which include also data generation in some cases. And together they really illustrate how much has been accomplished and how much we've learned through the research in HCA. Um, I think it has exceeded many of our of people's expectations. Bundles of this magnitude are really um, hard to find um, in uh, um, are really hard to find in uh, uh, in science. Uh, we're we're excited about it. Actually, we believe that while this submission window is closed, we already know there is new papers that are starting to kind of percolate up in our community and we imagine additional publication bundles in the future. If you have a paper in preparation that you think would be a candidate for a future bundle, please contact Ellen Todres. Those of you with papers in the bundle already know Ellen very well. Um, if we move to the next slide, great. So this work has generated a tremendous amount of data. These data on their own right have been uh, really material to the way people do science today. And I do not just mean people like us in HCA doing the science of HCA. I mean all the people who are actually using these data in order to ask a broad range of biological questions as well as medical questions that where they're trying to both understand the human body as well as identify opportunities to understand mechanisms of disease, develop new, develop new therapies, and so on. One of the things that is really material as the data has accrued is to integrate the data into draft atlases. We still have a very long way to go. We'll speak about that in a moment. But at the same time, we also have to assemble the things that we already have in hand. Now, last, uh, um, actually uh, last year, we uh, started the process to build those integrated atlases. And in this, if you move to the next slide, sorry, in this, and I think there's an animation, thank you. Um, in this, if you, if, if you look at it, we really rely on our 18 biological network. They become the foundation for our atlas assembly strategy. So if you go to the next slide, um, we survey our networks every quarter. Actually, there's a survey out right now. So thank you for all of you who have filled in our survey. And if you would like to be surveyed and for some reason you haven't, all you have to do is sign up as a member in HCA. These allow us to track how many cells have been profiled by members in the, in the HCA. And um, many of these cells have already made their way to the public domain. There are data that are available to others, but many of these cells are actually still being analyzed by the labs that have collected them. So this is a really a forward-looking view to where things are. And so now the data has accumulated on these scales, we can start thinking about how to put it together. One of the things that's exciting about these numbers is that when you look at it, there are some areas where the numbers are very big, but we kind of expected them to be big because these um, um, efforts have been uh, very dominant from the early stages of the atlas. For example, work on the gut or work on the lung. What is also cool is that areas that actually have been uh, far uh, uh, um, started later in the process for HCA, for example, working on human the, the, the female reproductive system, or working on, um, on the mucososkeletal system have actually been catching up really quickly, including because technologies have really scaled well during this time. So now we're trying, starting to think about how do we integrate those cells together? Now we take our cue, if you go to the uh, next slide, from really the first effort around integration. It started in COVID times with our efforts to understand COVID, and morphed into the uh, lung biological network's effort to build the first draft of the human lung cell atlas. This was published earlier this year by Nature Medicine in an effort that was led by many, but in particular Lisa Sikiama and uh, Malte Luken from the Helmholtz, working with Fabian Thais, Martin Nawin, and all the leaders of the all the leaders of the network, uh, Sasha Misharin, uh, Jay Rajagopal, and others. 
Um, in this effort, the biological network combined 49 lung uh, data sets into a single integrated atlas containing 2.4 million cells from 486 individuals. This atlas was published in June 2023. It was reported in over 60 articles in the popular press and in news websites, but also has already been cited, which is, I think, more material for science in scientific publications. Um, the team in the biological network is working already to expand this atlas to include additional data and enhance cell type annotations. But this also provided a real proof, both of the value and of the feasibility of coming together and delivering inter integrating atlases. And so, in fact, about a year before this was released, we were already hard at work, both to uh, assemble teams, to start working on data integration across many areas. And so if we go to the next slide, we are tackling the uh, integration challenge in uh, three cohorts, if you could click, please. And each of them includes six biological networks. In the first wave, um, we have the immune system with a focus of, on PBMCs, to be clear, kidney, the eye, the gut, the brain, and the lung in its evolving uh, uh, situation. Um, and if you click again, two atlases are already out, the first draft for the lung that I described already, as well as um, an integrated atlas of the human retina, which appeared on BioArchive actually about a month ago. If you go to the next slide, the, um, oh, sorry, if you still, I, I had one more thing I want to say about the retina. My, my apology. So the eye network coordinator, Rui Chen, and his colleagues are from multiple labs. In the retina atlas, there are 2.4 million cells from 55 donors, including single cell, single nucleus, and single cell ataxic data. And that allowed them to, to create a comprehensive human retina cell atlas, both of the transcriptome and of chromatin accessibility. And it unveiled over 110 cell types. I can tell you personally, as a retina enthusiast, this is one of these gratifying moments because, of course, the retina is the tissue in which Ramon Ikahal first characterized neurons by their structural traits based on staining into different types. And so I think this is a nice closing of a circle between the HCA and the many endeavors scientists between us has gone through, through other kinds of technologies to characterize the cells of the human body. If you go back to the, if you go now to the next slide, we go now to the next slide, of course, also a little over a month ago, on November 8th, a suite of 21 papers was published in Science, revealing the largest atlas of human brain cells to date. It was produced by researchers in the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, also known as BICCN. Um, these papers presented molecular and cellular maps in up to 100 different regions of the human brain, and they identified more than 3,000 different cell types. This might sound to you like the human brain atlas, but as you can see even on the cover, it says brain cell census, not brain cell atlas, because in fact, this is like the pre-draft in terms of the brain. The brain is, you know, an incredibly complex organ with an enormous cellular and structural diversity. And so this was the, this was the, this was the pilot run towards what became the full cell atlas initiative known as the Brain Initiative Cell Atlas Network or BICAM which is underway to integrate these and further brain data into a single brain atlas. Um, and of course, our network coordinators, um, Ed Lean and Stan Linerson, are two of the leaders for BICAN as well. Um, this brain atlas produced by BICAN will form the foundation for the HCA nervous system atlas. And it is just one example of how HCA, our scientists are parts of these other consortia with which we partner in order to leverage the best research available. If we go to the next slide, we are now already in the next wave of integration, although it's just getting underway, and while still doing, enhancing, improving, and making additional versions of the previous atlases. This next wave involves the heart, the liver, the skin, the pancreas, the oral and craniofacial, and genetic diversity, uh, oral and craniofacial, another great example of a, actually an effort that started relatively late in the HCA history, but has caught up very quickly and is now in our second wave of integration. The third wave is going to start in early 2024, and we include organoids, adipose tissue, breast, reproductive system, mucos mucososkeletal, and development, which is a 
a unique and distinct challenge. And we look forward to reporting on their progress at future meetings. And so this, just to tell you a little bit from under the hood on how these teams work together, this Atlas, um, this Atlas uh, uh, integration um, efforts involve a team of computational biologists that work with each biological network in order to curate and integrate the data sets. The integration team also continues to evolve in parallel the methodologies that we are using for Atlas assemblies and move them around the different atlases while addressing the unique challenges of different tissues that can have very different problems uh, biologically and computationally. And as these new tools are tested, we learn lessons and we share them across the team and we're building more and more reproducible tools, generalizable tools and insights that are important in terms of data QC, how we analyze for covariates, label, uh, harmonize label, benchmark, and use the best tools that are out there um, right now. In each of the bio networks, they have nominated a group of bio network champions that collaborate very closely with the integration team, as well as with the HCA cell annotation platform or CAP um, to provide frequent updates and to solicit inputs from the members of the bio network communities. And I really want to acknowledge the hard work of all of these people and teams, as well as the funding that we get from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative that in support of this project, any of you can get involved by joining one or more HCA biological network. And for those of you who already actively participate, I just want to thank you again. I know this is a lot of work and I also know it's a labor of love and it's a truly global effort. It's amazing to see how collaborative this community is. So now, of course, when you have all this data, you also want to serve it to the world. Um, if you uh, turn to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, another milestone for us um, this year was the release of the new HCA data portal. It happened just last month. John will show you soon in much more detail um, many cool screenshots from the portal. You can still um, use this portal to explore hundreds of HCA data sets, each of them individually but it also includes dedicated components for the biological networks and their integrated atlases. So for example, the published lung and brain atlases are already accessible through these uh, pages and retina will be posted in January. People do deserve a little bit of a break before then. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, while these initial um, atlases represent really major achievements from HCA, they're actually just a start. They are by and large, if you click, they are by and large reflecting of single cell RNA-seq data. It's not surprising. This was the first technology to scale. So it was of course adopted the most widely by now and led to the most data. But as you heard, even in retina, it's already integrated also with single cell chromatin data. So if we click to the next slide, to the next uh, click, uh, multiomics, it's not just coming, it, is, it has long arrived. And so of course, we're working very hard to transform these into atlases that cover many aspects, not just the uh, transcriptome, but also other components, the chromatin, protein levels, protein modifications, metabolites, and so on at the single cell level. And if we click again, of course, we need to position them in a spatial level as well. I mentioned the brain as being incredibly complex anatomically, but it's actually true for every tissue. We need to know it at the histological and anatomical level. And on top of all of these layers, of course, if we click to the next level, we need to do it across the diversity of humans. And so we still have a way to go. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more. So if you go to the next slide, I am now going to, uh, I believe I'm now going to, no, 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 they're still with me. So um, if we're querying, uh, uh, um, if, we, if we also want to work on this data, it's not enough to serve it technically through a portal. We actually need to give people tools in order to query the Atlas. So if you click uh, for the next slide, um, we have, uh, really, we have really actually go back. Sorry, the animations have confused me. People, it's hard when you don't click yourself. Um, the um, one of the things that has really emerged in parallel to our efforts, and honestly, was not a big surprise for us in HCA, 
is the great success of machine learning algorithms, and especially in the last couple of years, the great success of very large scale models that are trained on very large scale data with very large numbers of parameters and have foundational properties in the sense that they can capture very complex domains and generalize in the distribution of that domain. And these kinds of foundational models play very nicely together with the data that we collect in HCA. They are data hungry, and we have the data for it because as a community, we were prescient for the last several years actually collecting it, and now it's ready to go. And so we're starting to see these foundational models meet HCA and generate for us cross-body maps. Just to put a fine point on the data collection, if you go back to the next slide, data in our domain, this is not just HCA data, this also includes disease data, doubles every six months. And it's been going on like this since the first introduction of a droplet-based single-cell RNA-seq technology. It's not all based on this one technology, but you can see the enormous um, increase in data scale. These are um, in, 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 uh, in, 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 in the scale of the data. That increase is really substantial for our purposes. So if we go to the next slide, Sorry about that. As a result of that, we're starting to see these foundational uh, models emerge. In fact, um, the slide needs uh, probably frequent updates because they keep coming up. So for example, SCGPT um, from the University of Toronto, from the Vector Institute, shows one approach for multi-omic integration, multimodal representation uh, learning based on transformer models, as is GeneFormer from uh, Shirley Liu, um, and a model like Similarity, um, actually use, uh, uses metrics learning with a strong focus on querying. So these different foundational models are actually fine-tuned also for different and optimized for different kinds of tasks that people might be interested in from, you know, transferring of annotations to asking where is my cell. If we go to the next slide. Um, and with this, I will turn to um, uh, John, who will describe to you the HCA data portal in further detail. And thank you, John, for uh, clicking uh, the slides as well. You, you're welcome. Uh, Do you want to take a, a quick question? We have one from the audience. Uh, just curious why we uh, surveyed the bio network uh, prior to put, uh, surveying the cells that are actually being put on the data portal. I would observe that on the data portal, you can actually get the metrics for the data that's actually been published through the data portal. Uh, but do you want to comment on sort of the value? Yeah, of practice? yeah. We survey the data before because that is actually the information that is least accessible to people around the world. If you really, really wanted to know what's actually published, you can go. You can you can uh, scrape uh, geo. You can uh, go to our portal if it's just for HCA data. You can get to the information. But if you want to know what people are doing right now, one of the strengths of HCA as a community is that we can actually understand that number too. And that's really material. So for example, if you work in a particular domain and you realize, oh, I can only see a little bit of data out there, but the HCA is telling us that actually, in, I don't know, in the mucososkeletal network, there are already 2 million cells. Oh, I'm a mucososkeletal scientist. I might engage actually with the leads of the biological network and want to see what's going on there. Maybe there's an opportunity. Maybe there's an opportunity for my data set. Maybe I wouldn't be collecting something that I would do otherwise and devote my effort in a different way. So that's that's one reason. That's for our community and the global community. The second is for our funders. Funders really need to know where things are trending because there is a lag time between them thinking about what needs to be funded next and that work actually happening. That lag is substantial. They have to put up a program, then they have to put up an RFA, then they need to give people time to write proposals, then the proposals need to come in, they need to get reviewed, the money needs to go out, the work needs to start. That lag, even in a very fast organization, is, can be a year, and in most agencies would be two. Funders constantly want to, want to know where are the gaps. And if we only deliver to them the gaps based on what is published, there's constantly going to be these pieces of time where the work that needs to happen is not happening. So the survey also helps the funders understand in broad strokes where the community is. This is impossible to achieve information often, especially in, in uh, academic science. And then the third component to this is that it could um, help people tie together. We occasionally, when we run the survey, it's a touch point with our community and people tell us things. 
and they ask questions. They say, yeah, I did this, but I will also point out to you this, or I will also point out to them that. So the survey itself is a form, but we send it by email. And sometimes people just fill in the form and some people actually reply to the email and they share a lot of very useful information and usually ask questions that they need help with. So it's also a nice uh, touch point with the community. Overall, it seems to have served us well uh, and uh, is a it's a it's a very it's a very nice bang for the buck. I will I will stop here and tend to t turn to John. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have another question, but actually it's a perfect question oh. for our discussion later on. So I think I'll save that. Save uh, that for later. I also want to say to people, uh, happy holidays and a happy new year. I will leave before the end because unfortunately I'm also double booked for another. Um, another commitment that was pre-scheduled and I couldn't move. So at some point I will just uh, have to disappear, but I wanted to wish everyone happy holidays and thank them for their amazing work on HCA this year. Thank you, Aviv. Uh, so as Aviv has already mentioned, we do we are very excited that we've just released the new HCA data portal last month. Uh, it's still at the same URL at data.humancellatlas.org. Uh, she's giving you a, a quick preview, but I wanted to actually take you through some of the new features and really explain to you where to find information on atlases and data sets for HCA. Um, so this is what the new homepage of the HCA uh, data portal looks like. Uh, we still up here above, there's a, a button called Explore Data, which goes to our, appropriately enough, our Data Explorer, as we call it. Uh, that Data Explorer um, allows you to, to, to search uh, through uh, over 400 HCA data sets, um, encompassing 50 million cells, which goes to the previous question, actually. Uh, that Explorer has itself been redesigned to improve usability and so forth. So, uh, you know, as always with the portal and with the Explorer, we always welcome feedback uh, on features and designs and so forth. Uh, but the real exciting addition here to the data portal is uh, a new se sequence of pages that are centered around the HCA biological networks. And you see that down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, you see all 18 biological networks listed. And if you click on any of the networks that have published an atlas, so again, as if you've said, this uh, so far has been lung and nervous system, and I with the retina will go up next month, <clears throat> that will take you to a, a web page just for the um, for the lung network itself. You have a description of the network, you have uh, information on who the coordinators are, and then most critically down at the bottom, you have a list of the atlases that have been published to date by the lung network. And in this case, of course, it's the uh, lung atlas that was published in June that Aviv has already described. And as multiple versions or different variations of atlases for each network come out, they will also be listed here as well. Um, if you then click on the name of the atlas down here, that will take you to the atlas page. Uh, here, there's some really critical information about the atlas. Uh, in this case, it actually describes both the full 49 data set at atlas uh, and also a core uh, uh, atlas that encompasses uh, far fewer data sets and some description about why uh, they organized it this way. Uh, the, again, over on the right here, you have links to the publication, to code, uh, contact information for the leads for integration and for the network. And then um, down below in the panel at the bottom of the screen, uh, you have uh, information about how to actually access the atlas, or in this case, the component atlases, and that refers to the core versus the full atlas. Uh, there's the name of the atlas, and then you can actually see in, on the very far right uh, column, we've actually worked with Cell by Gene to implement a direct download from Cell by Gene of the atlas itself. Uh, and the, the column to the left of that, there's uh, marked Explorer. You can actually then link out to Cell by Gene. So that's an external link to Cell by Gene. Uh, the vision here really is to have um, many visualization portals that would uh, potentially serve different atlases. And so as, for example, uh, with the eye, uh, they have uh, the ataxi uh, data that Aviv mentioned is on the UCSC cell browser. And so when Retina gets published on the data portal, the, there'll actually be a link to UC, UCSC cell browser for the ataxi data. Uh, there'll be other examples with other portals, uh, single cell expression atlas, bro single cell portal, other portals as well. So the idea is really to have a rich ecosystem of portals that each op offers its own, um, its own features. That being said, we uh, we have worked with Cell by Gene to establish Cell by Gene as what we call the matrix store. So this is sort of the um, the the central source for count matrices that are used in integrating uh, atlases. And so that gives us uh, sort of a, a benchmark to really where people know to find uh, HCA atlases. I'll also point out that there's this is actually just the first tab on this page. There's a second tab marked source data sets. And that tab actually gives you all, in this case, all 49 data sets that, that go into making up the, the lung cell atlas. 
And here, if you click on these links, you actually go to the HCA data repository page for that data set that gives you the ability to download uh, metadata, uh, raw data files, uh, other, other files that are associated with that data set, and also it has external links out to uh, Cell by Gene and other portals where you can, where you can uh, visualize these data sets as well. So the idea here is really to provide a great deal of transparency about what data sets are actually being used to, uh, to make each version of these, of these atlases over time. I'll just briefly show you the nervous system page because uh, this actually had two atlases that were published as part of the package that Aviv mentioned, one on brain and one on neocortex. And so this, <laughs> excuse me, uh, this sort of shows how we can uh, use this, this uh, data portal to really portray multiple atlases coming from a, from a particular network, uh, in, which could be multiple versions again, or it could be different anatomical regions. Uh, here we actually have created a tab for the BICCN publications that went into the science package. And so this also shows, for those of you who are really heavily involved in the biological networks, that we can tailor some of this content to meet your particular, uh, your particular need case. So as Aviv said, we're very excited about this. I think it provides a lot of transparency, a lot of accessibility. We really think of this as kind of a gateway to the atlases, uh, both to the data sets that are on the HCA data portal, but also to atlases as they're uh, held on external uh, uh, visualization and analysis portals as well. And again, uh, just to reiterate that anybody can help build the atlas and assemble all of these atlases. You can simply join, uh, very easily join one or more biological networks. This uh, QR code will take you to a uh, form to sign up for the biological networks if you are already an HCA member. If you are not an HCA member, please join. Uh, you can go to our homepage at the bottom of the screen. There's a button to join HCA, and that will also uh, allow you to name biological networks that you wish to be a part of. And if you do that, then you can contribute data set. You can you can contribute to the curation of data sets, support assembly of atlases, participate in cell type annotation jamborees, uh, join bio network meetings, and uh, network and collaborate with others in your field. Okay, so I will uh, then now come to the next section of the agenda, which is a panel discussion with some uh, some really terrific panelists. And here we want to really focus on on sort of future priorities and opportunities. So I'm going to go through this really quickly and sort of set up the panel discussion, and then we'll welcome our panelists. Uh, so we're really kind of in this, in the course of this webinar, we're describing where we came from, where we really began with, um, uh, with data collection, community building, data analysis, and so forth. Where we are right now is, is the initial assembly of atlases, and where we're trying to go is to assemble a, a comprehensive, complete human cell atlas. What does that entail? Well, as Aviva's already talked about, the different uh, data modalities, uh, spatial transcriptomics, and human diversity. Um, together, those make up sort of what we think of as two of the three sort of main pillars of building a comprehensive atlas. So the first is we need to build an equitable and diverse atlas. The second is we need to build a three-dimensional searchable atlas. And then third, we need to build portals that enable us to easily uh, search through all of this information, uh, integrate it, combine it with other data sets, and so forth. So this is quite a monumental task. And the panel discussion uh, that we're about to embark on will explore each of these pillars in a little bit more detail. So with that, let me uh, welcome our panelists. Uh, they include uh, Maz Hanifa, who is from the Welcome Sanger Institute, as well as uh, Newcastle in the UK. She is uh, actually all three of our panelists are members of the HCA Organizing Committee, and in fact, are also members of the Executive Committee, which is appointed by the OC and serves as kind of a sounding board for the staff, as well as various working groups uh, in between organizing committee meetings. Uh, so uh, Maz, welcome. Um, Maz is also, I should say, a coordinator of the Development uh, Biological Network as well. Uh, we have Chloe Vellani from MGH Broad and Harvard. Uh, Chloe is the uh, one of the co-chairs of the Immune Bio Network. She is the lead PI on the cell annotation platform that you heard about earlier. As I said, she's a mem member of the organizing committee and the executive committee, and she is a co-chair with Sean Pradokar of a, a new working group called the Data Ecosystem Oversight Group, which is providing critical guidance to many elements of the data ecosystem. And finally, Gary Bader. Uh, many of you uh, know Gary because he uh, hosted our general meeting this summer in Toronto. Thank you, Gary. Again, a member of the organizing committee and executive committee, a leader of the Liver uh, Bio Network, and a member of the analysis working group. So thank you, uh, all three of you, for being here. I'm going to begin by uh, asking you a few questions. We'll have a little bit of a conversation with ourselves, and then we're getting a number of questions here as well uh, that I want to make sure that we have time to address. But let me start. Um, with uh, a question that I'm actually going to put to 
Chloe uh, in her capacity as the chair of that data ecosystem uh, group. Uh, Chloe, can you sort of expand on what we've heard so far and tell us what we've learned about as assembling atlases over the past year and how we're applying that to, uh, to future atlas development? Absolutely, Dan. It's such a pleasure to be here today with my colleagues. Uh, it's been a tremendously enriching endeavor to start assembling these atlases because unless, you know, we've been all very good, each of us at doing your own data set, but it's a whole different type of challenge to come together and bring these data sets together. So it's about stress testing our HGA data ecosystem at so many levels. So that includes, for example, like things we've learned, you know, finding out the most optimal strategies to wrangle the data and the metadata. And there's so many options for metadata. We spend a lot of time reflecting ultimately what are the key metadata that we actually really need to benchmark Atlas assembly, like how do we go about integrating? How do we make sure that we harmonize our metadata and that we document it so that we can speed things up moving um, moving forward? It's also um, it's also about testing different uh, integration methods and trying to figure out how we can quantitate uh, the rationale for how we ended up um, deciding on integration framework. And finally, trying to think about uh, how we can derive consensus annotation framework to kind of bring all of our community together around each biological network to reflect on a common uh, lexicon. Now, right now we're focusing a lot on molecular definitions of the cell, which of course will, will evolve over time as we start thinking about the 3D assembly of our um, atlas. Um, we, and, and the third, uh, I, I'm realizing that we're all using the word pillar, John, I apologize for that, but the third feature of what we've learned um, is, is thinking about once we have an assembled atlas, how do we reflect on the best, um, uh, how can we best consume this atlas in terms of biological queries? What type of information can we gather? So we tried structuring our ecosystem around three main features uh, or pillars, or which, um, which include now, uh, you're going to hear more and more about this in, in the first quarter of 2024. We have a metric store in close partnership with uh, Cell by Gene, supported by uh, CZI, that have now standardized field for key metadata we think are essential for assembly. We have a cell annotation platform that has been assembling some detailed documentation on the key features we need to assemble consensus annotation. And then very close partnership with our colleagues at ABI to think about the really key fields we need for biological queries as well as raw data. And the last bit I will say is assembling atlases uh, helped us create very detailed documentation that we'll release to the community and we're open for feedback, but also helps us define the gaps uh, and, and it'll help us think about the roadmap. Um, and I guess we're going to talk more about this part of the discussion. And I also want to quickly point out to make sure that there's um, we're not misleading about what we're doing. Uh, in these first rounds of Atlas building, um, we're not necessarily going comprehensive and taking everything that is out there. I'll give myself, for example, for the Immune Bio Network. We selected initial data sets to stress test a system. So it's very focused on blood. So there's many different layers that can be added as we start connecting different organ systems. And so the short version of this very detailed answer is um, we now have more structure in our ecosystem. We have assembled more detailed documentation, which we hope will, will make um, the contributors experience of connecting with the Atlas assembly effort uh, easier, more pleasant and enjoyable. And we look forward to working with all of you in the community. Great, thank you. I'm actually going to um, piggyback on this to ask you to answer two of the questions that we've received, one about uh, whether uh, the atlases are batch corrected and the other about where to find information about uh, how the data sets were normalized to, uh, to allow integration. Two excellent questions. Um, we spent hundreds of hours on discussing batch correction. So the Assemble Atlas that will be um, released publicly will definitely be batch corrected. Um, uh, and not will we be releasing the codes that, um, as well as the rationale for the methods and parameters that will have been selected. There's a lot of time that's being uh, spent in assessing the different methods. So it's not a one size fits all solution. Even the parameters and the methods being used, we try to tailor them to every biological network. Uh, and, and so this is a true partnership with those that actually really know the biology and those that are very savvy in some of the different computational methods. And that's uh, that ties into the metadata that I mentioned earlier. We've been trying to figure out what are the key metadata we need to account for in batch correction. In terms of methods for data generation is the other question, John, right? So is that the other question? Uh, no, right. the, the information about independent data set and other normals, absolutely. Um, uh, as John showed you on the portal, 
um, you, you, you will get to see the integrated um, object as well as their you know, information of how we got there, as well as every individual data set that are part of this integrated object and information of, of the, you know, the quality control filters that were used, how they were normalized, if we start from raw data or not. So that will all be made um, available. And I should say, most of these efforts, once we get an integrated object, well, um, there will be an, uh, an invitation for everybody to engage to different forms of annotation jamboree. So that will build on this integrated object. Open to all, I should say. Perfect, thank you. Um... You, all three of you have uh, so many roles that I tend to forget some, and I did forget to mention that um, that Muz is also on the uh, equity working group. And so I would like to ask, actually first ask this question of her and then others can chime in as well. Uh, you, we've, we've always had the goal of being a fully representative uh, human uh, atlas, but that's also a huge challenge. And so could you maybe touch on some of the strategies that HCA might take to accomplish that goal? And also, what are some of the other aspects of diversity that don't fall under the, the sort of ancestry rubric? Thanks, John. Um, I guess I'll approach it from the kind of like um, lessons from the Human Genome Project. I mean, it was immediately recognized that diverse representation was important in terms of uh, ensuring that, you know, future use of the reference atlas was going to be valuable in terms of looking at variants that cause disease. And if you didn't have diversity in the reference genome, then that makes it harder uh, to, to associate it. So I guess, you know, recognizing that it is important for us to have diverse a diverse atlas. And, and for that, um, which has always been uh, something that HCA has tried to achieve um, despite its daunting task, is to ask perhaps now, what we have and what we don't have, and objectively looking at what will be the impact of removing certain data sets to clearly have objective measures of why diversity is important. So if you took a blood immune atlas and then you eliminated specific um, groups from the analysis, how will it change the outcome? Uh, and that gives objective measures and can be used to solve you know, expand and, you know, emphasize why we need a diverse atlas. And using those kind of like objective mapping of what we have and what we don't have and what are the consequences of, you know, not having um, some specific data sets, uh, we would then need to think of how we engage equal and equitable partnerships to generate the diverse data sets, recognizing why it's important and actually how do we exchange knowledge and work together in a collaborative setting across um, you know globally and across sort of um, you know the current sort of disparities between the north and you know the south or or certain continents for example uh, and I think that really requires a good engagement with local communities good partnerships having training and capacity building but also identifying what's relevant uh, in terms of tissues that need to be mapped, that's relevant for local diseases uh, and so on. I think those are quite important steps that we have to take. Um, and then perhaps consider funding of consortia that involves a group of individuals so that, or a group of researchers so that you capture the area, uh, but ensure that there is also peer support network. And I think much of the initiative like we've had in HCA Latin America, HCA Asia, a very good example of how groups have, you know, provided that support and have enabled the generation of data in the case of the AIDA project, approved uh, for blood mononuclear cells from a range of ancestries in Asia. I think there are lots of lessons that we can learn and emulate and start to expand in other parts of the world. Um, and then I think finally, in terms of what are the other kind of like uh, diversity uh, metrics, in, in some ways, there's also the kind of like geography in addition to sort of like ancestry, because, you know, people may be from the same ancestry, but actually live in different continents. Uh, and that is going to have an impact in terms of the environment that they are living, their lived in experiences. Uh, there's also diversity in terms of, you know, being a dermatologist, I would say, you know, the areas of the skin, uh, how different parts are exposed to the environment, 
you know, similarly the gut in terms of the microanatomy of the gut and the exposure of the gut, which is, you know, another uh, barrier organ. Uh, and also, I think fundamentally, uh, you know, lifespan, the temporal component of aging and development. And I think uh, those are other kind of uh, diversity indices that we should start considering uh, and perhaps mapping out what we don't have and why we need them and working partnerships, building consortiums would be the way to, to address these. I, I want to pick up on, on a question uh, in the Q&A uh, that relates to this as well, because obviously a, a challenge here is simply the cost of the technology. And in fact, uh, the cost is often higher in uh, lower resource countries than in uh, in richer countries. And so there is a question about technologies that, that have the potential to have greater access or lower cost, particularly uh, the um, Ignatius Liu was citing uh, microfluidic single cell technology. Could any of you comment on, on how we think about that in the context of a project like this? And I think this is where being part of a global initiative like the Human Cell Atlas is really going to be beneficial because we can start having the negotiation power with the you know um, companies who are supplying the reagents or the transportations or and, and so on and so forth because as part of a bigger consortium you you have more power to leverage um, why they might want you know the, these companies might want to reduce the cost and actually negotiate a good deal for those projects so I think um, you know it for me, it's it is almost you know unbelievable that the costs are so dissimilar for whatever the reasons may be, uh, but we do need to address that. And having that global you know sort of communities to address that is important. But I think the funders could also play a role uh, in saying that if we fund this large scale consortia uh, in a specific place, then why not also include as part of the you know, discussion that the, the levers that a funder can play uh, to negotiate prices, et cetera. And I think having partnerships across uh, groups, so for example, the North and other parts of the world to try and actually enable these kind of um, uh, partnerships that could actually um, improve on costs of uh, undertaking experiments and also compute costs um, and infrastructure costs. I think Chloe's um, got a hand up to perhaps add to what I've answered. I completely agree with everything you said. And, and just to add and answer the question, uh, we are not biased to any particular methods in terms of the single cell data generation uh, in, in terms of selecting the data sets and which one are going to be integrated. They're definitely not limited by those that are a macrofluidic space. So we absolutely welcome any forms of data sets, uh, whether they're there, you know, it's all about how you parse the cells um, to a single cell level, which can be done in many other ways than microfluidics. Uh, what we do is we we put um, we prioritize those that are high quality in terms of the output of the cells, in terms of you know making sure there's enough genes, the cells are not dying, which you can see by looking at the data and so forth. But it doesn't need to be microfluidics. Just to be clear. Thank you. Actually, do you want to pick up on the question uh, about? about quality control and, and eliminating doublets and six cells and so forth. And yes, and at the same time, perhaps a question about the metadata and the elegant paper cited. Um, and um, uh, the, I'll start with a quick metadata, uh, elegant paper that's cited here. Um, uh, most of the fields cited in this paper, which I just opened to uh, refresh my memory, are indeed included. In the, in the list of metadata. So that is, we do cover a uh, biosource where the tissue came from, how the cells were isolated, how the libraries were constructed with all the different batch key and, and how they were sequenced. But we also even have even more information about how the downstream data was processed. And so our, our metadata is based on in the initial cis, uh, cell by gene uh, schema, and we added another uh, 40 fields very that very much aligned with this um, and, um, and, 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 and that have been now tested for integration. In terms of QC, um, so every team that's assembling, you know, uh, has their own opinion and own approach to it. Uh, we are not being prescriptive about how it should be done. I can speak from the experience of the immune bio network, where we are putting a prior and making sure that not only the data are realigned in a similar way, 
that that we are performing quality controls um, filter uh, per data set and reviewing which cells we're excluding. So we are testing for doublet poor quality cells, but we're not blindly removing them. We actually then go and look at which cells we're actually removing by looking at the profiles of these cells and keeping track of all of these cells downstream. There, everything is being tracked so that anybody that want to make use of the assembled atlas can see which cells were removed and the reason for it. Um, some may choose to keep some of the cells. Removing doublet can be very hard in some instances, depending on the biological system you're studying, because it's assuming that you're co-expressing two programs we're assuming are coming from two distinct cells, but it can prevent us from discovering new cell types. So one needs to be very thoughtful about how we approach this. So one way we're approaching it for the bune marrow network is running several algorithms, independent algorithm, and seeing if we're seeing the same output. Uh, and then we manually go and, and see what we're removing. So we're keeping track of it and we're making recommendation for everybody to actually be thoughtful about QC filters. And importantly, releasing the information of how the object was processed. Absolutely. Uh, I was going to ask a question related to, um, to other data modalities, but I actually like uh, uh, having uh, Godness's question better. So I'm going to ask that instead. Uh, he asked, what, is, uh, what exactly is a cell from the HCA's perspective? Uh, it's clear that capturing multimodal data is critical for establishing cell type and function, but there are obvious technological limitations to the types and amounts of data that can be acquired. Uh, it cites as an example uh, intracellular proteins uh, that are an essential part of a cell's identity and function. So the question is, how does the HCA plan to search for and integrate future capabilities around multimodal analysis? It's a big question. Maybe we'll let Gary answer this one. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll answer. Um, so. But from my perspective, that's of course, you know, of course, we need to collect that data. Um, I guess the way that the community has worked is focused on modalities that are easier to collect and and more accessible. But um, and and we hope that more modalities will become accessible. Like you know, for proteins, there's spatial proteomics with um, uh, IMC uh, um, that you know can identify protein measurements. At a subcellular resolution, and I understand that 10x genomics and Xenium is going to be bringing up protein, you know, or there there there's different spatial proteomics uh, uh, methods that are available. As those, we hope that those become um, more accessible to everybody, and then we'll be able to collect more data. So it is technology limited, and it raises the challenge that part of what we're doing needs to work with technology developers. And the technology developers should, I, we, we should communicate these challenges broadly in the community so people can think about, you know, how are we going to actually technically collect, you know, metabolomics data, protein data, um, you know, surface proteins, intracellular proteins um, at different levels of resolution inside a cell, outside a cell, the tissue level. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a very important question that we all need to be thinking about. Maybe I, uh, to add a few thoughts on this um, from a philosophical standpoint and then pragmatic. You know, as we think you were asking about cell identity, so cell identity comes from different, you know, it's, it's multifaceted. It's a composite of all of these layers of information that we're adding. It's definitely more than just RNA attacks, secret spatial acquisition. It's also its function, as it was pointed out. The question is, like, at which point are we starting to saturate some of our definition of the cells as we add some modalities? Uh, I think that answer, we don't know yet how the identity of the cells will evolve as we add more and more. It's clear that we haven't reached saturation of that information because as we're adding more modalities, including, as Luz pointed out, like increasing the diversity of our, of, of our exploration and mapping, but also within space and 3D, we've yet to really achieve the full picture. And, and, and so we're barely, I think it's important to know that we're barely starting to scratch the surface as we assemble these atlases. The way we've been prioritizing some of the measurements has been very pragmatic, has been about like what is scalable, <laughs> scalable in terms of number of measurement, number of cells, number of individuals we can do it, and more cost effective. And and that that is why you have so much um so much RNA in this first phase. But but um now that some of these other technology are are becoming more scalable, I won't say cost effective, but more scalable, it means we can start, you know, um testing how these other modalities help us um assemble a more complete picture of a cellular identity, which is which definitely goes beyond just this molecular definition. That's just our foundation. I think Gary wants to add more. 
And maybe one more quick point is that a lot of the mo modalities are related to each other, right? Like, um, you know, they're correlated. And so we could eventually, and we may pick, uh, talk about this later in the panel, think about how to automatically infer, um, you know, protein levels from RNA levels or, um, you know, metabolite levels from pathway activity levels or things like that. So um, I think once we get start getting a lot more data, especially, you know, enough training data from the different modalities, it might start helping us um, figure out those relationships and then we'll be able to chart a more efficient path. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, sorry, John, go ahead. I want to come back to that, but I also want to give Chloe a chance to address the comment uh, that we've uh, asking about doublets of immune cell subs, speaking of cell identity, uh, doublets of immune cell subsets and whether that is, uh, those are real and we should be capturing those. There's music to my ear because I'm the first one in the team to say, don't exclude the doublet. It can be real biology there. Um, and so that's why we we never just blindly remove cells that are likely flagged by doublets. We do need to kind of query and look at them. There's different ways uh, to try to you know start wondering and asking if these are really uh, new entities, including because we're assembling atlases. Do we see them in more than one data set? That's one, right? In more than one uh, context um, of health and disease or tissue. Um, and, and I should say that while we, you know, everybody may approach it a little differently, um, we don't necessarily kick them out completely, but one needs to be careful as you try to assemble and QC your integration, because if you have real doublets, it may make, um, uh, doing quality control in your, uh, assemble entity a bit more complex. And it's, it's likely to be more and more of a, pro a problem because, or a challenge, not a, pro a challenge, because several, um, groups have done, um, hashing or multiplexing of samples, which will generate by default a lot of doublets. So one needs to be very thoughtful about it, but shouldn't, as far as just speaking into my own name, in my own name, not remove them blindly. I think Ms. probably has some also thoughts about this. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point and agree with Chloe. It is a bit like, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, type scenario. Uh, and, and I think coming back to the previous um, discussion, uh, having multiple platforms, uh, having multimodal data, and the advantage of working together as a community within the Human Cell Atlas with multiple domain experts uh, will really allow us to sort of like evaluate this question in terms of uh, are these actually, you know, relevant um, cells that are constantly interacting and therefore you know sh we we have to kind of uh, approach this with biological context um and and also uh, quantitative measures that's all i'm going to say on that uh could wouldn't you address the question about a mitochondrial dna transcripts and then i have a question for gary that i want to end on gary do you want to take it yeah so um people have traditionally used mitochondrial DNA as a, uh, a clue to figure out if a cell is damaged. So the idea is that if you have um, damaged plasma membrane, the cytosol will be leaking out and with it, a bunch of cytos cytoplasmic or cytosolic uh, mRNA, but the RNA, the mRNA in the mitochondria will not be because it's protected by a couple of extra membrane layers. So um, you could look at that ratio to determine you know, if it's if it's an a extreme outlier, and then that might give you a clue to see if that cell is damaged. Um, problem, so there that that works to some level. The problem with it is that you can't just set a, a standard threshold for all cells. Different cells in the body have different numbers of mitochondria, like in uh, the liver and the kidney. There are cells with huge numbers of mitochondria, and so you you already expect bio biologically correct. It's biologically correct to see a large amount of mitochondrial. RNA. Um, that said, there are multiple other ways of thinking about this problem for identifying damaged cells. Um, other new methods are coming out, like one of them is droplet QC that's looking at a similar thing, but with a nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. And there might be other ones in the future. So it's not just a, so it's, a, it's, it's very useful to think about these um, biological signals to help us do quality control on cells, but there's not just one way of doing it. I just want to add something very quickly on that because there are also there's also value in some of the mitochondrial transcripts in that there are algorithms that allow you to actually track the cell lineage using those 
and in certain cases you actually want to enrich for those so i guess it's also dependent on you know um what can be done with those data sets so you know there's a lot in terms of what can we what we can learn from the existing data sets and is very much dependent on the question that's being asked absolutely uh, so we really are at time. Um, I wanted to give maybe Gary 30 seconds to address a huge topic, but one that's really exciting and has a lot of potential in HA, and then we will have to come back to it uh, at the next town hall. But that is uh, the, the role of machine learning and foundation models in particular in uh, managing and, and actually uh, not just managing the data, but also just in pulling out new insights. Do, can you maybe just highlight one or two particularly exciting opportunities you see there? Sure. So you know, we've worked so hard to collect so many cell transcriptomes and a lot of other types of data. Um, and so now we have over 100 million cells. And I suppose in the near future, we'll have billions of cells and this number will keep growing for a long time. So, so now's the perfect time to think about what we're going to do with all of this information. And machine learning is um, a great uh, method for processing a huge amount of data to find patterns. Um, so it will help us solve technical challenges like batch correction that will be improved by improved machine learning technologies, but also will be useful for developing better answers to a range of interesting biological questions like helping to define cell function, which is a complex issue that still needs a lot of work, um, understanding how cell fate is determined in dynamic tissue processes like development, and figuring out how cells work together at the tissue level, tissue architecture questions, um, automatically relating different types of omics data layers to each other. This is related to the question we, the, the point we made earlier about how um, different omics data layers are, are, are correlated. So machine learning can help us find that those relationships automatically with enough data, um, predicting the effects of perturbation, mapping biological pathways and systems. Um, and then, you know, a, a fun thing for the future that people in the machine learning community are thinking about right now is, can you integrate human language with this information so you could actually talk to your data? So you can ask it questions, even verbally, you know, what's, you know, what interacts with, uh, you know, what's co-expressed with my cell or what cell type is this? And it would actually automatically answer, look at your data and answer the question. So that's more of a fun future idea. Um, one last point is that, you know, we, we do need to make sure that the machine learning methods are interpretable. We can't just leave them being black boxes uh, that will, you know, interpretability is critical for um, our ability to understand and, and use the, the information. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so that's all very exciting. Stay tuned because I think there will be much more on that topic uh, in, in the months to come uh, in HDA meetings. So with that, uh, again, we are at time. So I want to thank everybody for, for coming. I particularly want to thank our panelists and thank Aviv and uh, my colleagues um, behind the scenes who've made this webinar possible. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Happy Everyone for coming. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye.